Python episode, The Bishop. Did you ever see it? No. It's kind of a spoof on um, The Man From Uncle spy show. But instead of um, UNCLE, it was uh, Bishop. You know, and it had this like badass Bishop walking down the street with his staff and his big hat and these like tough priests walking alongside of him smoking cigarettes. <laughs> I love to observe people. Do you a burner sir? Any chance? Well, if you reconsider between now and October 10th and register, I'd appreciate any consideration. I'm running for U.S. Senate. Democrat or Republican? I'm agreeing. I'm neither one. Too often, this is what it seems like in Washington. But to get things done, you've got to work together. I teamed up with Joe Lieberman to make college more affordable for low-income families. And Barbara Boxer and I wrote a law protecting open space. I'm even working with Hillary Clinton to limit inappropriate material in children's video games. Because it makes more sense to wrestle with America's problems than with each other. I'm Rick Santorum, and I approve this message. Let's face it, uh, Rick Santorum has been mocked for his statements he's made about the Lawrence decision, about gay marriage and gay rights and, and privacy. He's been mocked even on The Sopranos, where Tony Soprano said that's Senator Sanatorium, because he says if we have gay marriage, next quote, we'll be doing it with dogs. I mean, that it, Ron, you've got to go after this one. Is he a national point of contention? Senator Santorum. Yes, he's become a national laughing stock, in fact, for many of the reasons that you've just mentioned here. And, and let's just face it, he's toast. I mean, he's not I'll, toast. I'll no, he's that. toast. He is he's toast. down five or six points. He's gaining. Yeah. Let me tell you, Ron, just one But point. only five or six the points because the Green issue. Party is starting to siphon votes Look, away I, from I Casey. Be... Please welcome United States Senator Rick Santorum and President George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st President of the United States. I'm the only candidate in this race who put 10 ideas, very specific new ideas on the table. He doesn't have any. So his plan for the future, were he to be reelected, is you can only conclude more of the same. It's the same day in and day out for us. It's time to penetrate that millionaire's club of lawyers known as the U.S. Senate with one of us, and that's why I won't give up. Thank you all for being here. I, I just cannot tell you how much energy this gives us. This has been a, uh, uh, an incredible campaign. Uh, as, uh, as all the pundits say, this has been the biggest Senate race in the country. Well, I'm telling voters it's a real choice to make here. It's a fundamental choice, and uh, I think voters are ready for change. I think there's a lot of rank-and-file Democrats that if they saw me, if they had an opportunity to hear me debate, they would be more than happy to back me. Where I get a lot of resistance are the union leaders, the leaders of these pro-choice groups, the leaders of peace groups. Oh yeah, they don't want me in the race. I don't know, for pro-choice, anti-war candidate. <laughs> See, <laughs> they don't want me in the race. <laughs> Do you think that the fact that we have been free of terrorist activity in this country for five years is an accident? No. The answer, it is not an accident. It is not an accident. It is because we were able to go out and retaliate for the damage. Yes, they took down two towers. We took down two countries that were supporting terrorism. They lost. They're sick and tired of this crowd in Washington taking us down the wrong path. They know that this Congress failed on Iraq, and this country's paid a dear price for that failure by this Republican Congress. And by the way, Rick Santorum, last time I checked, Rick Santorum is a, quote, leader in that Republican Congress. As Thomas Jefferson said, it's the duty of all defenders of freedom and liberty to stand up to threats against it wherever that may be, even if it comes from your own government. 
I'm opening my headquarters in this neighborhood on Lancaster Avenue okay. tomorrow at uh, 4134 Lancaster Ave. Okay. So uh, we'll, we'll refreshments. At noon. Okay. We'll have refreshments. Uh, they they better. Yeah. Right. I hope so. <laughs> right. I'm the Green Party candidate for the second congressional district. It's basically made up of West Philadelphia. I got in because I was concerned that uh, when India started testing nuclear weapons in America, would have no idea how to handle the threat. I had problems. I ran in the Lancaster County area, and I'm the I'm definitely the edge of, of the liberal in this state. I smoke marijuana openly, and that caused some real serious problems in the Democratic Party in Lancaster, where they actually put out rumors about me that I sold drugs to children. The Greens had no candidate for um, United States okay. Senate in yeah. 2004. Has everybody got their bids in? Get in, get in your bids. Right now. Uh, then in late 2005, I was approached by some members of the party as to whether or not I would accept the nomination this year. Uh, I thought about it for a while and said, of course. And I knew that I had to do something to lead this party to the ballot, to get these issues out there. Uh, I was the candidate at the top of the ticket, so it was my responsibility. Measure your trust in me based on the fact that in the face of everything and all of the personal stress that we have been put through, that we are willing to fight to the end to bring these issues to the debate. Welcome to a debate in the race for the U.S. Senate, sponsored by KDKA-TV and the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Hello and welcome to our debate between the candidates for U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania. While we want to cover a lot of important issues tonight, Senator, let's try to get something as, as basic as where you live out of the way. My, my residence is in Pennsylvania. That's where I pay my taxes. That's where my driver's license is. We have a three-bedroom home. My kids and I slept there last night, as we do on most occasions when we're here uh, in the Commonwealth, unless we're some other, other place in the Commonwealth. That's the reality of the situation. But most of my time is in Washington because that's what you sent me to do. You sent me to go to Washington to fight hard, to show up for work, which is something that my opponent doesn't do. Well, it's interesting. <clears throat> I've heard the senator answer these questions a lot of times. Every time he answers it, it seems that, that uh, the answer changes. This wouldn't be an issue in this campaign if he was straight with the voters. So you should be straight with the people of Pennsylvania. Time is up. Pay the money back. Senator, 30 seconds. All I would say is that we spend 35 to 40 weeks out of the year, and I show up to work. According, so do I. Last month, so how, many, I. how many days were you in the office 9 to 5 Why don't at the you Treasurer's your question, office? Senator? How many days were you in the Treasurer's office 9 to 5 last month? As much month? as you were in the U.S. How many, I, I, spent eight, I got 88 percent of the votes and the half the votes I missed because I was here for a funeral for Bob O'Connor. Answer the question. Look in the camera and tell people how many 9 to 5 days you spent Senator, in the Treasurer's office. Senator, answer your question. Office. I'll answer it. I just did. Yeah. I told you. I told exactly yeah. the number of people. I spent Talk 100 days Spectre. a year. Look in the camera, Mr. Casey. Talk tell to the Senator people Spectre. how many times you spent. You guys don't need her. been interested in politics my entire life. My father was a news person, a reporter, photographer, and editor. He covered uh, many of the big political campaigns that came through town, including Kennedy's campaign in 1960 and the Humphrey-Nixon race in 1968. So I've been around it my whole life. Probably my biggest inspirations in politics are the Kennedys and Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, grew, growing up through the 60s, it's hard not to have a political consciousness, especially for myself as a student of American history. I really love the story of the American Revolution, what our country was supposed to stand for. But then what I was seeing in the outer world was causing tremendous conflict especially the civil rights movement. Even as an elementary school student, I found it hard to believe that in 1967, we were still having this debate. I remember a transition period uh, somewhere between third and fourth grade where I went from being blindly uh, in support of the Vietnam War because we had troops there, many of whom were in my family, 
to understanding the exact nature of that war. Many of the positions that I hold today uh, are the same ones that I've held for a long time, at least 30 years. Well, the Casey Santorum race, the national context is that it was obviously an extremely important uh, race in terms of uh, the Democratic bid to take over the Senate. And I think the choice of uh, Bob Casey Jr. speaks to that in a way because the, the Democrats really went out and tried to find someone who had, well, first of all, the name recognition statewide. It's a brand name in Pennsylvania and could therefore raise a lot of money and was socially conservative enough, particularly on abortion, to draw in a number of conservative Democrats who, you know, have been deserting the party uh, in a number of ways, thinking that it was just too sort of socially tolerant on, on a number of things. And so he was able to perhaps hold some of those people. They wanted to get a, a candidate who would not just sort of fit the so-called national liberal party paradigm. You know, they were really trying to find somebody who could win. And that spoke to the importance of taking down Santorum. They wanted to leave nothing to chance. There are a number of tight races across the country where a pesky third-party candidate could make the difference between winning and losing for a Democrat or a Republican. And in every case, it drives the main parties crazy. My next guest is causing a lot of trouble in Pennsylvania in the Senate race there where Rick Santorum is defending his seat against Democratic challenger Bob Casey. In fact, Democrats there are trying to get him off the ballot. So annoying is he. He is Green Party candidate Carl Romanelli, and he joins me from Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. So the Democrats don't even want you to have the right to be on the ballot. They're spending a lot of money. They have a team of lawyers coming after me, um, and I continue to beat them back. Here you have a Democrat. I mean, if the vote were held today, all polls indicate he would beat a strong incumbent Republican. This is a big, big deal. You can see why your fellow liberals would be pretty mad at you about getting in the way. What's so bad about Bob Casey? Well, I, I just think that I'm the better candidate. If he was really confident in his vision for America, he would be willing to debate. We're talking about the United States Senate, Tucker, the world's greatest deliberative body, and a man who refuses to debate. At least I am committed to the principles and the vision that I have for this country, and I want to talk about those issues. Hey, America's Most Wanted is here, so you know. <laughs> no, we better stop talking. They might be trying to, you know, America's Most Wanted might be here. Oh, you know my God. I, I just need to see Evan Kravitz. Oh, yeah, He's yeah, in. Please, uh, uh, no, but I, I'm in Philadelphia today. It's Carl Romanelli. I'm a candidate for United States Senate. And Evan oh, was... Did you want to buy some advertising time for KYW? Uh, I, I might if KYW includes me in the debate. So far, they haven't because Bob Casey's afraid to debate me. I remember Ralph Nader, the times that he ran, was yelled at in grocery stores, assaulted in Starbucks. He'd come to the green room to do a TV show and the, you know, the cameraman would be mad at him. I mean, many, many Democrats were furious at him. Are you taking abuse from Democrats because of this? Not too much. I was downstairs and was wondering if you had a minute for me, because we're probably going to have a big story if we win in the Supreme Court. I get about 50 uh, nasty emails a day, and uh, some people are really upset about my candidacy. But on the other hand, when I get out and reach voters, uh, many are very excited about this candidacy. They like my vision for America, and they like the fact that I am standing up to the bullying of of a very uh, difficult system for an independent it voice certainly to is. crack. Pro Romanelli, a true believer. Thanks a lot for coming on. That's the thing that we're always up against, is trying to push the poll numbers up to be included, but you can't really push the poll numbers up until you're included. Pennsylvania is known nationally among third party people and ballot access experts as being one of the toughest states to get on the ballot. It's a very, very difficult environment uh, for third-party candidates because of all the rules and regs. They vary state by state wildly. And they have to spend often an enormous amount of money and manpower just to uh, get the signatures and um, to get them on time and to get more than you need because a lot of people are going to be thrown off the, the, the rolls. I just introduce myself. I'm Carl Romanelli. Raymond Double D Store. Pleased to meet you. I know it's Romanelli. Okay. Romanelli. Romanelli, yes. I'm running for United States Senate this year. 
and I'd appreciate any consideration you might give in voting for me. We collected 99,802 signatures. It's tough to run an independent campaign. In oh, it's independent? Oh, okay. Pennsylvania, but, uh, well, Green Party, but. Let me see if I can't get some campaign donations out here. My, my, my point is. Oh, <laughs> excellent. Thanks, Double D. <laughs> All right, thank you, sir. When a third party movement tries to get on the ballot and scurries around to get signatures, uh, anything could be challenged. I mean, some of the signatures are illegible. You know, some of the signatures are not of people who are registered voters. And if the established parties want to come down hard on a third party movement, it doesn't take much. We made history by filing more voter signatures than any candidate in the history of Pennsylvania. And in order to get those signatures, we paid people from Philadelphia and Harrisburg and Pittsburgh we paid them a living wage of ten to twenty dollars an hour. Sure did because I did it. Oh, you did it. Well, did well it. thank you very much. That's right. And the more you, the more, the more you people you get ready to, the more money you get. Yep. I did it. Yeah. So you worked for Acorn. Did you work for Acorn? And what organization is that? That's uh, it's it's a, uh, it's a help program on Broad Street. It's a help program. Casey Challenge challenged 70,000 of the 94,000 signatures. A bunch of them they challenged globally. They tried to wipe out like stacks, thousands of signatures at a time by going after notaries, by going after the circulators. And he's right about that, but I did it. I get 10 hours an hour, I was working three hours a day. 10 hours an hour, the more voters I sign up, the more money I get. Yeah. 10, 12, 15, up to, up to 20 dollars And I was in the yeah, shelter at that time. Yeah. Pennsylvania is a great example. You know, the ability of them to tie you up in court, you know, the, the, the courts in Pennsylvania ordered us to be in something like 10 courtrooms at the same time in order to defend our signatures. Now, for a small campaign without the resources of the big parties, to be in 10 courtrooms at the same time is not an easy task. There would be people who we assumed were acting as agents of the Democrats who would uh, come up to us and say, oh, Green Party, could I sign it? And then when they'd sign their name, they'd put a line through the entire petition, meaning our petitioner would have to throw that away and start over. That was St. John the Evangelist uh, Elementary School, and I went to school there in third grade. Man, it creeped me out. I thought God hated me, you know. It was really hard on me being Catholic because I believed a lot of that stuff, you know. And I just, you know, thought there was no way I could ever be good enough to meet this standard. I'm bound for hell. I'm bound for hell. Oh, that's the house I grew up in. That's my old house, by the way. Uh, Anyway, yeah, I, I... So, running against two Catholics, do you think that they have a higher moral standard than you? Is Santorum Catholic? I know he acts like one and yeah. talks like one. He is. Uh, but I'm not Catholic anymore. Once I started getting interested in politics, I didn't care so much about being scared of, uh, you know, burning in hell. Um, so, I guess by third grade, I was, I was over that stuff. But in those early years, oh, man... You know, I really thought that I was evil. Why would you do that made you evil? Well, you know, I didn't listen to my mother. I never came home on time. Uh, the shit the nuns used to yell at me, everything from wearing the wrong sweater to using too much paper. I mean, I thought that these were major offenses of, of dishonor and disrespect, you know? Not to mention these crazy thoughts that I had in my head every time I saw Nancy Sinatra. Do you have a thing for Nancy Sinatra? <laughs> I have a th had a thing for for a lot of beautiful women. Who is your favorite? Uh, let's see. I thought Nancy Sinatra was the bomb. I thought uh, Petula Clark. I just loved Petula Clark. Uh, hello. Hey. If the Democrats were really an answer to what the Republicans are doing to us, why did they give Bush the power to make war? Why did they give him his war? Why did they give him the Patriot Act? Why did they not put up more resistance?
offer the people a real alternative and send a working class person working class values and a commitment to, to fighting. And I think nothing demonstrates that more than the way I've stood up to these democratic bullies in this ballot access challenge. Progressive left liberal constituencies have been attached in one way or other to the Democratic Party, but have been very frustrated in recent times with the Democratic Party in terms of not seeing their issues prominent. First of all, I was a Democrat most of my life. Um, and though my politics were the same, I tried to voice those politics through the Democratic Party. In 2000, I was a Democrat who supported Ralph Nader for president. Uh, I was really angry at Al Gore for choosing Joe Lieberman, but I was still maybe able to hold my nose and vote for him because I didn't want Bush. There's always this toying, uh, why are we dealing with Tweedledee and Tweedledee Dumb between the, you know, these two parties, why don't we be independent? That gets Ralph Nader a lot of votes, and I, you know, although he argues he pulled them out of the Republican Party, he primarily pulled them out of the Democratic Party. It was constantly, I agree with George, I agree with George, I agree with George. So I got really frustrated at a Democratic Party that was trying to out-Republican the Republicans. I registered as a Green Party candidate the day after Election Day 2000 because I saw what was going on in Florida and I believed that the right wing was going to steal the election and the weak-kneed Democrats would let them get away with it and I vowed I would never again apologize for the candidate I support for any office. Democrats are celebrating today's ruling to remove the Green Party Senate candidate from the Pennsylvania ballot. They had challenged Carl Romanelli's candidacy arguing that he didn't have enough valid signatures on his nominating petition. Well, a state judge agreed today. Republican Senator Rick Santorum had backed Romanelli's bid, hoping he would siphon votes away from the Democratic challenger Bob Casey. Our appeal of Tuesday's ruling, that's due this Monday, which that's means my attorney only has three days to prepare this. Let's see. Oh, maybe. Hello? Hi. Pennsylvania is a great example of a major obstacles for third parties. They put in place a system that requires third parties to get tens of thousands of signatures in order to get on the ballot. That's absurd. First off, to get the party recognized, they have to get ballot signatures and get the party recognized. That's enough to show public support. Yet third parties have to go additional step and get 50,000, 60,000 signatures in order to get on the ballot. It's absurd. It's a, it's a, it is what you call a, a manipulation of democracy in order to limit the choice to two corporate choices. Oh, man. Now, if we win here, though, Larry. A Romanelli, you know, try to get, out, get those signatures, and, and then they knock signatures off for the most absurd reasons. You know, rather than saying where it says print name and signature, someone reverses that, they knock the signature off. Give me a break. Judge Collins, on September 1st, gave them the ability to amend their challenge so they could go after the same signatures we just beat them on for different technicalities. Look, I didn't just get off the boat. You know, I'm streetwise enough that when I'm in a situation and the fix is in, I know it. Well, I think uh, the decision was probably correct uh, under the existing law, but I think the existing law ought to be changed. It ought not to be that hard for third party candidates to get on the ballot. We ought to d design a reasonable threshold and not key it to a presidential election. So the Green Party candidate, Carl Romanelli, is now off the ballot. Yes. And should he get back on the ballot? What do you feel about that? And what did your campaign do to get him off the ballot? I was wondering if you Well, the Democratic to... Party challenged him. He's not on the ballot because uh, the uh, petitions that he filed were uh, full of fraud. And if you commit fraud, you shouldn't be on the ballot. Once a judge gets on the bench, I think generally they leave those past things behind. But if the attorney for Romanelli thought that the judge was prejudiced, he could have asked the judge to accuse himself. Both judges are Democrats, Democrats and partisan Democrats who have denied me my right to due process. Judge Kelly not only signed his order, but again, whacked me with all the fees for everyone. Now, you need to understand how unjust that is. I didn't bring this challenge. I was only supposed to defend it. Move on now. Never run you a want to privatize the National Casey Weather Service. Smith has too. the next question now for Mr. Casey. Stacy, good luck. 
Sorry. Thank you, Kip. <laughs> Mr. Casey, your opponent uh, says that nuclear scientists from uh, Iran and North Korea are working together to develop nuclear weapons. What should this country do if it is confirmed that those countries have indeed developed nuclear weapons or if it's proven they are providing smaller nuclear weapons, such as the so-called dirty bomb in a suitcase, to terrorists? What we have to do, Stacy, is what this administration has not done, which is to do everything possible to prevent Iran from developing nuclear capability and a nuclear bomb. And the same holds true with regard to North Korea. You're right. I disagree with the, with the administration to have on the, Iran, on the Iran policy. I disagreed with him inviting the former president of Iran. You know his name, I'm sure, the former president of Iran who came to this country? You can finish your question. Okay, I'm sure you know who he is. Uh, how, did, how did you feel about him coming to this country? Just to, I didn't think to, it was good policy. Well, right. And his name is? And, and I, I okay. supported your, his name I supported Kos your his legislation. Name was, his name was Kasimi, and he was a very dangerous man, and he shouldn't be allowed, and the administration and I went to war on that issue. Can you tell us about a woman's right to choose and your stance on that issue? I think you know, I think you know, our, me, I think you know our position. But what about for the female I'm, voters? I'm, I'm pro-life, and you know what I'm also in favor of? Funding, birth control, and family planning, especially emergency contraception. Rick Santorum doesn't support that. I do. It's a big difference. In the oppositions that uh, Rick Santorum and Bob Casey have regarding abortion and women's legal reproductive rights, it's the same thing. It's inflicting that, that personal religious view on the law of the land. And we have to understand that despite our strongly held personal views, we have a responsibility as leaders to look out for the constitutional and legal protections of our people. And I see absolutely no benefit in criminalizing a procedure, in criminalizing a doctor, and my God, in criminalizing the women of this country. Well, it, it seems to me that if you're gonna get on the ballot, you have to have a, fo a following. And this isn't about a, a you know, day at the beach, it's about running for office and having a debate on the issues. And it seems to me a good political exercise and organizing tool to go out and get those signatures. Are there any Democrats in the House? <laughs> people who are ready for victory? I don't think those leaders speak for the rank and file. And I think that's part of the problem. You know, it's not the principles that are motivating these politics. They simply want a cocktail party of their own. Our elections have been reduced to being about as meaningful as a football game because issues and principles don't matter whatsoever as long as the guy wearing my shirt wins. Can you talk about the influence of uh, Carl Romanelli on this race and what the uh, Democrats have done to him to prevent him from getting on the ballot? Well, I mean, it's, just, it's sort of a classical uh, situation where you have uh, a, uh, a candidate who is trying not to stand for anything. Casey's trying to be brand X. Once we get into the issues, uh, I think he finds he doesn't get a whole lot of support from either camp because he's uh, he, he doesn't doesn't take strong stands. He doesn't take principled stands. He sort of blows out there in the wind to whatever group he's in front of. And so when you have a candidate like Romanelli, who has principles, who stands up for what he believes in, I don't agree with him, but I, I have a lot of respect for people who have the courage of their convictions. And I can tell you that Casey doesn't, and, uh, and that's why he wants him off the ballot. Got a, you Senator got a Rick Santorum, problem. you just said the enemy of my enemy is my friend. You and the Green Party of Pennsylvania. <laughs> it would be helpful to you to have a large Green Party turnout to reduce the support for the Casey campaign. Have you had any dealings, or has your campaign had any dealings, to, to get them on the ballot, to do anything to support anything for the Green Party of Pennsylvania? Any yes, role at all? Absolutely. We've, we've been absolutely upfront about the fact that we want the Green Party on the ballot. We, we've asked, uh, we asked folks to circulate petitions for them. Uh, we asked, uh, we, in fact, we even had uh, folks who, who work for me and volunteer for me to go out and volunteer and work for them. Santorum, the senator, the end of fun. It's not so much that I chose Senator Santorum as the person that I want to fight against as uh, it is that Senator Santorum chose me. Senator Santorum has a problem with uh, sexual minorities, and he has, uh, from his perch in the Senate, raised, waged a rhetorical war against gays and lesbians, and we have returned fire. It's one thing to be opposed, it's another to have a solution. Well, you know what? When somebody sets a fire and then looks at you and goes, what's your solution? <laughs> it's reasonable to say, I wouldn't have set the fire. 
Our system is weighted against third parties. I think uh, most political scientists would argue that's probably a good thing. It tends to moderate uh, American national politics because your nominees, A, must form coalitions before elections to get a majority. And B, the process of forming coalitions requires people to moderate their views. Back in 1850, you had two parties, the Whigs and the Democrats. The Democrats were plantation owners. They supported slavery. The Whigs were northern industrialists. They also profited from slavery. So what's someone who opposes slavery supposed to do? They worked for 100 years to try to end slavery by 1850. So they started to create small abolition parties that started to get a small percentage of the vote. They grew and grew, and finally by uh, 1860, they elected the most successful third-party candidate in history, Abraham Lincoln, and the Whig Party disappeared, and slavery also disappeared. But it was those people who voted for the abolition parties in 1850, 1854, who got 5% of the vote. Those were the real heroes of our electoral history because they stood against the immorality of slavery while the two parties profited from it. Lefties do idiotic things like vote for Nader because it feels good. And uh, it, in the short run, it may feel good and be gratifying, but in the long run, it's been a disaster. And not voting for Casey because you're going to pout because he's not good on your issues uh, means returning Santorum to the Senate, and he's worse on your issues. And if returning Santorum to the Senate means that the Republicans maintain control of the Senate, that's going to be terrible for your issues. So you have to be rational about these choices. The obstacle to third parties in America is institutional and cultural. Institutional primarily, the winner take all. Uh, there is no profit in getting 20% of an election because you have no say when the thing is over. You can't, uh, you're not required by somebody to, to form uh, a coalition. Your support's not needed. So the incentives for standing outside an election contest by running a third party protester are quite low. The Democrats like to use that argument to hurt us all the time and to try to keep us from participating. Uh, I just turned it around and used it to benefit us because we needed money. We asked folks who would like to help them financially to go ahead and do it. I know right. members of my campaign did. The Re Green Party in Pennsylvania is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Republican Party. Anybody who contributed knows I'm not bending on uh, my stand on any of these issues. I haven't softened my criticism of the policies of the president or our senator. Um, so uh, I see no problem with it. And if taking Republican money is really a sin, then Bob Casey's on his way to hell because he takes it from Republican PACs and has taken a whole lot more than I have. This is an honor for me during this race when we are engaged in such an important struggle for our country to have a man who has fought for this country in every way you can possibly imagine to be here today to lend his support. It is a true honor and a privilege to introduce <laughs> Romanelli may want to like rim my ass three times a week. That doesn't make him better for me, and it doesn't make his presence on the ballot better for me than a Casey victory. K Romanelli has no fucking chance. Romanelli's only chance is draining votes from Casey. A pro-gay rights candidate is not going to take votes from Santorum, and Santorum knows it, which is why Santorum tried to get Casey, tried to get Romanelli on the ballot. I often think of my father, who served in the United States Senate, and once he said to me something about, well, he had. He, he, he liked Lyndon Johnson as the leader of the Senate. He leader, Lyndon was the leader of the opposition in those days, the Democrat. My dad was a Republican. And I said, why? He said, his word is good. When he says there's going to be a vote at a certain time, his word is good. Politics, they didn't agree on hardly anything. But they agreed on the word of honor. And one of the things I have respect for in, in our man Rick Santorum is his word is yeah. good. He did not vacillate. You know, I've got this kind of, I see how the wind is blowing here, or when they change position. I think he's got something in common with the president on that, I might add. I have put together many a left-right coalition over the years, so I have plenty of friends who are Republicans. And I've always had a philosophy where I'm not afraid of Republicans and I'm not afraid of socialists because we're all Americans and we have to talk to each other and we're a whole lot of other things before we're members of political parties. We're parents, we're teachers, we're citizens in a community. Carl Romanelli should be dragged behind a pickup truck until there's nothing left but the rope. Are you a member of the Green Party?
Uh, I'm not, but my nephew is. I'm getting ready to change, though. Why? Because I, I'm t uh, after everything that's happened to him, and uh, uh, everything else and what have you, I'm really disgusted. So I'm not really sure which way I'm going to go, but I know one thing: I'm certainly not going to be what I am now. What are you now? Democrat, to be honest with you. I'm a Democrat. What What specifically disgusts you that? Uh, Casey wouldn't uh, do any type of uh, rebate with him or anything else, and he has a lot of good ideas. And really, what happened to him it really should not happen to anybody, especially with a nice family like that. They all have have real legitimate problems. People are struggling for health care. They're struggling to maintain housing. They're hoping that they could afford to buy their medicines. They're concerned about a community in in which crime is is through the roof. Uh, when when people do work, like the folks behind the counter, they're the ones who are being fleeced with all of the income tax and the sales tax, while the wealthy in this country are having a party on the backs of people like this. And nobody not only speaks for, for these people, but there, there aren't candidates who, who live here with the people. On immigration, Mr. Case. You've said, and you have ads saying again and again, that you're against amnesty. Well, what we have to do, Jim, and what, what he didn't do and what the, what the Senate didn't do, they passed, they passed some uh, border measures recently, days before uh, a re-election campaign for a lot of them. But what he didn't do was take a tough stand on securing the border a long time ago. I don't know what happened. Everything we do, it, I do it with my family. I understand. Never, never got problems with the police. I go over here 17 years. And you work, work, work. I pay taxes. I have been clear. No amnesty. One of the reasons the immigration's increased in the last few years is because there's been all this talk of amnesty. Ur Urbano came to me. We were friends from doing our laundry together and seeing each other in the, in the community. But he had no idea what I did, but because of the way I talked and the way I dressed, he thought I was a lawyer. And, and he was just looking for help. Even as a Senate leader, we see just since he's been in the Senate leadership, an increase of illegal immigrants from Mexico up 87 percent. The fines against employers are down 99 percent. Not a parking ticket, nothing. He's been an upstanding citizen who went to work every day took care of his family. He's got family living here. All, He's got all grandchildren. All here that you say, I got to go to Mexico. When? When we go? Mexico no got nothing. All my family. You got yeah. deported? Yeah. They're, they're, they're trying. What's bad about the Senate bill is giving benefits to illegals, like tuition benefits, which my opponent supports because he would have voted for that bill, like Social Security benefits. What you just heard as well is, a, uh, is an assertion by Senator Santorum that I, that, that I want illegal immigrants to have Social Security benefits. I don't, and, and no one does. Me, single, old man, no family. Over here, he's got a daughter, he's got a granddaughter. And, and, and a life, a life they've made by working hard and contributing to the community, not anything they've taken from us, they've given to us. You know, and, and many of us have done that. Thank you. Okay, my friend. Okay, this is where you could have an immediate impact on the quality of your life, is right here in your own communities, and that's one of the Green Party's values, is grassroots democracy, community economics, building institutions from the ground up. Pennsylvania, as far as I know, does not have the kind of grassroots organization that you do have in other states which really does prevent the kind of challenges, easy challenges that can be done by the established party. So, you know, if you're in New England, for instance, there's a real machinery to the Green Party in Vermont and in Maine, uh, and there they're gonna fight back any challenges. Carl Romanelli is a rail industry consultant. He was the Green Party's candidate for U.S. Senate from Pennsylvania in 2006, but was removed from the ballot. It's uh, a, an absurd reality. I, too, have counterculture roots. So to go through a year where people like Al Franken and Keith Olbermann are saying terrible things about me, 
and then listening to Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh and, and Tucker Carlson saying nice things about me, <laughs> my, my whole world was turned upside down. Uh, it's been excellent. Uh, nice turnout, a lot of committed people. The, the message here is very similar to that of my campaign. The problem with having too strong a leader on the top and building from the top down I think is indicative in what happened to many third parties, uh, most recently reform. When the leader is gone, like, like the CIA used to say, cut the head off and the rest of the organization dies, well, you can't cut the heads off of millions of grassroots rising. <laughs>
LLP. They've given them like $68,000. And who are they? They kind of uh, do a lot of legal advance and, and PR work for oil interests here in America. But somebody that wants to shift the focus from petroleum to other uh, uh, combustibles that might contribute to taking CO2 out of the air like I do, I don't even get to talk about it. I really believe tonight that this state, this great commonwealth spoke with one voice, and that voice was a clarion call for change. And it starts here in Pennsylvania. I wanted to talk about the issues. And I thought that given fair opportunity to go in front of the voters, that I was a better choice than Senator Santorum or Bob Casey. And here's something I'd like to say to Bob Casey. When will you debate me, you Nancy? You're so afraid because you have no policy prowess, you have no plan, and you will be a senator that does whatever your handlers and your contributors tell you because you're in it to stuff your pocket. So can you talk about what's going on today at all? Or, uh, uh, well, we're having a hearing on the costs in the Romanelli case. Well, it didn't take very long. Maybe the third or fourth day I could see that the fix was in. And they were setting up setting up everybody, especially on the, on the invalids. They were saying the invalids are it's, they're only temporary in a sense. And then later on they became more permanent and more permanent until they became, in their mind, totally permanent trying my best to hang in, hoping for the best today, but of course, uh, as I pointed out before, I'm not so naive as to expect the best. Uh, I expect to get screwed here today like I have been for the past several months, and I'll have to appeal this either to PA Supreme or uh, to the U.S. Supreme. It's a place that you've read about or, or seen uh, on television, you've heard from senators over the years, and uh, to be there yourself is a great honor. And I think it's, for me, it's been a combination of uh, a feeling of gratitude and one of obligation. What would your father think of today? I think about him all the time. Uh, in, in May of this year, it'll be seven years since we lost him. And uh, he, I think, would be very proud, obviously, as any parent would. The, the most frustrating thing on swearing in day was listening to that moron Casey when asked about his position on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He says, well, I'm going to Washington to listen and learn. You would think with all of his years in government and wanting to be senator, he would have learned something. Maybe he learned the name of uh, uh, Ahmadinejad, uh, the leader of Iran. How many bedrooms is your apartment? Two. You and Maria? Yep. Yeah, it's a regular city apartment. A lot of my neighbors are college students. This is, this is where uh, my landlord lives. And Mrs. Leone's been very supportive too because, you know, I've been running in and out at all hours and, you know, late with the rent, which I don't like to be. Whether I've, I've been a member of the Green Party or a Democrat, not only have my politics been the same, but my bank accounts have been the same. There was always a certain fortification uh, intrinsically when no matter how crazy the outside world is, you could come home and before that alarm clock goes off, roll over and just nestle into the comfort of, um, you know, the way your wife smells right here. And there's little things that, that you just can't buy. And you lost the Supreme Court case earlier this week? Yeah, well, I figured that that would be the case. Uh, uh, one, it's very difficult to get the Supreme Court to take on an independence uh, constitutional case. Larry Otter tried to talk to Bob Casey about this, and, and we wouldn't get a call back. There wasn't a high-ranking official that would call back. He still hasn't taken responsibility. And we might be able to have some fun tonight 
because Bob Casey's going to be in town just a few blocks away from here at the News Alliance TV studio, which is on my street. He's on the 6 o'clock news. I saw the advertisement on TV. Tonight's guest for the first time as a United States Senator, Bob Casey Jr. will be our guest. Sometimes it, politics gets in the way of family issues, and that's always pain, but, you know, that's Dad's passion, and he's a grown man, he can do what he wants. So I respect that. And, you know, his big dream, I know, isn't to be a senator, or, you know, he, he wants to, you know, to make the world a better place and be known for it. And, uh, you know, it's a very, very admirable dream. And I can't put anybody down for that, no matter, you know, how many fights we get into. And there were many days where it would be nice if you just had a dad that went to work at 8 o'clock, came home at 4 o'clock, and, you know, then we watched TV and ate hoagies or something. Um, it's a lot more interesting this way, though. Well, well... And if that, if that was the way things were my whole life, I'd probably be, you know, just, like, thinking the same way as every other kid out there. And I thank God that I don't every day. Regardless of the walls that crumbled around us, uh, the bond of, of our hearts and minds is that of a family. And we can sit here today and laugh about things in the past, you know. Or, or, or last night. Last night, right. Jordan came to a Wilkes-Barre City Council meeting with me. The most absurd thing I've ever seen. <laughs> First of all, they start the City Council meeting off with prayer, which I think really? is totally unconstitutional. Really? You know? It's really interesting. And then it's kangaroo court from there on out. Oh. You, they have people up there who can't read. You got pe oh, they discussed uh, what was on Oprah the other day. Um, you know, and these are people that run our city. It just makes me thank God that there's people like Dad who keep them on their toes. <laughs> he told them to stick it last night. <laughs> so, are you agreeing? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm a, me, Corinne. Uh, my brother. Although I I have considered uh, registering Democrat for the primaries to throw Barack Obama a vote so Hillary doesn't get in there, and then switching back to Green. Uh, the other day <laughs> we were having dinner at my brother's house, and the baby said to me, Uncle Carl. Barack Obama's fired up. <laughs> He's only two, and he watched the announcement speech with his father and then tried to tell me about it. <laughs> it runs in our blood. <laughs> I'm going to ask him if I could join him on the air and we'll have a discussion on policy in front of the people of Northeastern Pennsylvania. I think that's what I'll ask him. May I join you? Since we never had an opportunity to debate. You know, tell the people why you did this to me. So you're going to stand there and if he tries to blow by you, what are you going to do? Uh, he just tries to walk by. If he says, excuse me, then, if then, he says, Carl, we'll talk later, Carl. This isn't the right time. I have an interview. We'll, let's talk later, Carl. What would you say? Uh, I say if we schedule it right now, I'll believe you. And so, it, I mean, that's what his lawyer said to me, though. We could schedule a meeting. We'll schedule a meeting. And that never happened. He's not going to commit to anything. He does not have... Do you think that he's got the balls in his shorts to sit down eye to eye with me? I don't think he does. Senator Carl. Casey, we're long overdue on a public conversation. Nice to see you. Um, well, good to see you. I wish it wasn't under these circumstances, but I'd really appreciate any kind of help or leadership you could give regarding what's going on with me in the courts. I don't know how much you know of those court papers, and, and I saw you on film saying that I committed fraud, which we did not. 
Well, uh, and Carl, there's nothing in those papers when, when that... When things are in court, well, that's where we'll leave them, okay? That, that say that. Well, well, sir, it's all being done on your bidding. And you remember right down the street when I told you that Carl, if I qualified we're not, for the we're not ballot, have a public we argument here. Looking, we're I'm not, not looking, have a looking for argument. for for an argument, Carl, it's sir. Good to see I, you. I'm I'm nice to see you. Mr. Mr. Casey. Senator, I'm really will looking you make him pay the eighty thousand dollars? Will you drop the lawsuit, nice. Senator? Senator, why won't you drop the lawsuit against him? He's in chapter on our personal property. Uh, uh, so. This is the obstinance that I've dealt with, and, and the only chance that I've actually had to look into the man's eyes and talk to him is in this little block here of Franklin Street. Is there a reason, Senator Casey? We're your constituents. We're all your constituents. Thank you. Oh, he's going, driving us to the door. He's gonna go right to the door. I would go to the door. Let's just do it, let's just do it. Let him arrest us. He's gonna have to go in on the other side. Or he might just kill us and take the tapes. Stay here. Keep it rolling. I'm just winning, there we go. Senator, can you tell us why you're going to try to make a poor man pay $80,000, a man with a family? Can you tell us why? Why are you, you doing guys. that to a poor man, Senator? We'll We're your you constituents. Guys. Can you ask why, Carl Romanelli, a poor man, why you're doing this to him? We're your constituents. You, you have to answer to us sometime. You're hurting a poor man. You're gonna make him lose his home because you, a rich man, a millionaire, can't drop an $80,000 lawsuit against a poor man. Are you a Democrat? Are you, a, what are you? get away with this. This is so wrong to find someone for just wanting to speak in the United States. The only way you could enjoy your system or participate is if you're a Republican or a Democrat. You know, that's kind of lousy considering what we allege we stand for, what we sing to at baseball games. You know, I think we should be more than a song. I think we should actually live those values. Maybe not that the purity of the American dream has ever existed in this country, but it certainly uh, hasn't been as bad as it's gotten now for alternative voices to speak. Carl, tell me the best way to describe you in one sentence. I don't know, five foot six, 135 pounds of Italian American muscle. I'd love to host a Saturday Night Live, 
<clears throat> I envision this skit like based on all of the disinformation where we have like a Frankenstein laboratory and there's this slab with a blanket over it and for their creation they're trying to get something like really left wing so Dr. Frankenstein Karl Rove is throwing like maybe I don't know a, 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 a bag of pot and Abby Hoffman's uh, steal this book and <laughs> you know, maybe a copy of the Communist Manifesto or something. Then in a puff of smoke, their creation is made and I rise from the slab, you know, and then, uh, you know, maybe we could have somebody dressed as Santorum running over and dumping wheelbarrows full of money on me or something. <laughs> we could have some real fun with this. See, and, 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 and that's really my secret, using politics as a stepping stone to show business. <laughs>